So I've got good news and bad news. That was the bad news. No. Um, what do you want first, good news or bad news? Good news. Okay, what else? Bad. Who else? Bad. Michelle wants bad news. Okay, your husband's 50. That's bad news. <clears throat> I'm one of those, um, I like the bad news first because if I know bad news is coming, I can't really enjoy the good news because I'm thinking about the bad news. Um, so this morning, we're going to tackle what most uh, preachers or pastors or theologians would, would call one of the most difficult passages of Scripture, um, if not the most difficult. And it's been used in a lot of denominations as a fear tactic, um, as a way to hold their members captive, hostage. And so what I want to do is look at this extremely important passage, break it down, and we will start with bad news. But don't worry, uh, good news is coming. And then, of course, um, we'll partake of the Lord's Supper. And I just pray that this morning um, glorifies God uh, in a special way. Let's see what the scripture is saying. Hebrews chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washings and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Here's the bad news. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the power of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. For ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless, close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. Happy Sunday. I remember the first time I read that passage. Last, uh, this, this last August was 22 years since my salvation experience um, at Lakeview Baptist Church. And I became one of those people, and Mama can attest to this. I became one of those. She had actually bought me a Bible um, the May before that for my birthday. And as I read it over and over, especially the book of James, I say that every time. It's an unbelievable book, just five chapters. It's my favorite. Read it. It's unbelievable. As I read it over and over and over, I realized that I did not have a biblical salvation. I did not have a saving experience when I was seven like I had thought I had. And I read more and more and more. And finally, August, 22 years ago, um, I confessed that Jesus is Lord and believed in my heart. God raised him from the dead. I repented of my sins. God saved me. And I became one of those people who just read all the time. For mom, Christmas became going to Barnes and Noble 
and going and looking for books. I just wanted books and every type of Bible I could get my hands on. I decided I'm just going to start over. I'm going to just put aside what I think I know, and I'm just going to read. I'm going to see what Scripture really says. And then I began to teach Sunday school, which was a blessing. All we did was read from the Bible. That's what we do in our Sunday school class here with Kenny. We just open up a scripture, we read it, and then we just discuss it. That's what we did in that Sunday school class. And I began to teach the men's Bible study and began to do faith outreach and teach those classes. Went to other churches teaching those classes. I'm telling you, I ate it up so much that when I was saved, I was actually working at an Applebee's in Oxford. I was a waiter, a host. Can you imagine me taking you to your seat? I washed the dishes, I prepped food, I, mean, I did everything, I'd been there for so long. And then finally I became a janitor at that Applebee's along with everything else. I'd get there at two or three in the morning and clean the restaurant and then I'd go home and go back to bed and then I'd come back and wait tables. And this place called Big Apple Bagels, do y'all remember Big Apple Bagels in Aniston? Oh, it was so wonderful. I got to where I would clean the restaurant and then I'd just head straight over to Big Apple Bagels and I would study for three or four hours sitting there waiting for my shift to start at Applebee's. And these incredible men of God started coming and we would have lessons and I, it was just a wonderful time. Matter of fact, I was there so much, the manager of Big Apple Bagels hired me he said, you're already here. Why don't you just go back there and bake? And then you can have your bagels for free. That was a decision he regretted. <laughs> As he literally went into bankruptcy three months later. That is the truth. He didn't know I ate that many bagels, Jason. And in all of that studying and all of that preparation, I came across this verse. And I was so confused about its meaning and discovered how split people were on the teaching. And it really did, it took several months before I felt like I had a grasp on the meaning and who it was referring to. And let me apologize ahead of time. I lost my voice last week at the quartet convention, literally in the middle of, of singing it just left, and some other guys had to end up taking that spot for me. So forgive the way I sound. I, I'm in no pain. I don't hurt. It's just this is the way it sounds, so I've got my water. I hope you can understand the words and get the meaning and overlook the way it sounds. So a proper interpretation of this epistle requires the recognition that it addresses three distinct groups of Jews. First you had believers, then you had unbelievers who were intellectually convinced of the gospel, and then you had unbelievers who were attracted by the gospel. They liked the idea of Jesus, but had come to no real decision. If you don't acknowledge that, there's gonna be great confusion with this section of scripture. The second group where we'll put our focus were Jewish unbelievers who were convinced of the basic truth of the gospel but had not placed their faith in Christ. They were intellectually persuaded but spiritually uncommitted. And the reason I feel this is so important to look at is because I do believe we have a lot of those same people in the church today, not just Williams, but the church as a whole. And I didn't realize this until I started going door to door with the faith evangelism. I talked about that a little bit. If we didn't have somebody visit us on a Sunday morning, or there wasn't somebody sick that we needed to go see, we would do random door to door visitation. And we would ask what they called a key question. This was it. What do you understand it takes for a person to go to heaven? 
And you ask it like that so you don't get a, a yes, no answer. They, they have to tell you what they believe it takes for someone to go to heaven, for someone to be saved. And when I heard many of the answers, I realized the confusion that was out there. Most of the people would give me a works answer. You need to just be good. I try to be good. I try to follow the Ten Commandments. I try to be nice. Um, you would get their denomination. Many times somebody would say, well, I'm Catholic. I, I go to the Baptist church. I've been a Methodist all of my life. That was a big answer. But then you'd get one lady in an apartment complex in Oxford. I asked her the key question, what do you understand it takes? She said, before I answer, can I ask you something? I said, sure, absolutely. She said, will my cat be there? And I said, and I quote, right now, I'm not as worried about Tinkerbell as I am about you. She was angry that I didn't take her question more seriously. But I was taking it seriously. I was more concerned about her than I was her cat. But the saddest one, and I'll never forget it. We went to an apartment complex and two young ladies came to the door. And in that conversation, they're very open, they're very kind, wonderful conversation. Uh, they were willing to listen, share ideas, but they shared with me that um, they identified with the LGBTQ community. And I tried to share with them the gospel. I asked them the key question. And here's what they said, in agreement. They said, well, we know we're saved because we pray that prayer with Joel Osteen every week. And he told us that that would get us to heaven. I'm going to be very careful. That broke my heart. It doesn't matter what condition you're in. Some preacher telling you that all you got to do is just repeat after me and you're in. And because of that, they felt like they could stay in any condition they were in, no matter what the Bible said. And again, I fear many of us are like that. I read them this scripture, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, because it covers a multitude. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Fornicators, that's anyone who has any type of sexual relationship outside of marriage. Idolaters, adulterers, that's self-explanatory. Effeminate, homosexuals, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, Swindlers, none of those will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed and you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of God. The body is the Lord's. And they said, you know what? I appreciate that. They really did. They had no problem with that. And they said, but we're going to stick with what Pastor Osteen said. I said, that's fine. And I left. There was no change in their attitude. And on a side note, I understand how difficult it is. I really do to take a biblical position the way the culture is today. I understand but God's word doesn't change. So as I stated earlier, the more I witnessed, the more I saw a need for clarification in the church when it came to salvation. So let's dig deep into this scripture and we'll do it quickly, I promise. First off, like I said, we've got to look at the audience. Hebrews is written to three distinct groups 
And like the church today, not everyone's spiritual condition was the same. The writer of Hebrews, through the prompting of the Holy Spirit, spoke boldly to those who had all of the knowledge they needed, but had not come to a saving faith. You've seen God move. You've sat under the teaching of his word in Sunday school in years past. You've seen the spirit move in a service. You love to be around God's people, but you haven't taken a step of faith. That's the audience we're talking to. Look at the, look at the language. It says you've been enlightened. You've tasted the heavenly gift. You've shared in the Holy Spirit, tasted the goodness of the word of God. None of these phrases are definitive salvation phrases. We're not speaking of people who have been justified by God through faith. Let's look at each of them one by one. Enlightened. Look at John 1, 9. Here's what it says. There was the true light which, coming into the world, enlightens every man. Now, does that mean every man is saved? Of course not. Every man is not saved, nor will every man be saved. I remember one time having a conversation with a pastor's wife. We were talking about our favorite hymns and songs, and they leaned a little more uh, liberal in their theology than what I lean. And they said, my favorite hymn is when we all get to heaven. And my favorite word is all. When we all get to heaven. And she said, right. And I said, well, yes, all who believe. And she didn't like that as much. Enlightened doesn't mean that all are saved. It simply means they were enlightened, like Hebrews says. Let's look at tasted the heavenly gift. Hebrews 2, 9. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Was Jesus tasting of death permanent? Absolutely not. Tasting the heavenly gift is far different than receiving it. We see where the psalmist says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You can taste without receiving. Shared in the Holy Spirit. How many in the church, and we've seen them, they'll come in and they get so involved and they start worshiping with us and they start helping and they start sharing and all of the wonderful things that are going on, but never put their faith in Christ. They are sharing in the works of the Holy Spirit. That does not mean they possess the Holy Spirit. They can even feel something on the inside. It's a song that they like, or it's maybe a scripture that maybe brings back some memories of when they went to church as a kid. Just because you get holy bumps, as they used to call them, doesn't mean you possess the Holy Spirit. Finally, it said, tasted the goodness of the word of God, the power of the age to come. Again, we see that word taste. Many can sit Sunday after Sunday hearing the teaching of the Word of God, be blessed, find comfort, understand it, and never obey it. You've tasted it, but you've never fully put your trust in it. Hebrews is talking to those folks then and to a lot of folks now who have all of the knowledge necessary for a relationship with Christ, but they sit in rebellion, and in so doing, they agree that Christ should have been crucified, and they stand with his enemies. And at this point, according to God's word, it is impossible. That's the word it uses, impossible. 
for them to repent. Since they re-crucified Jesus and put him to an open shame. That's how that verse ends. But let me make this clear, okay? So there's no confusion. If you can repent, if you can confess Christ as your Lord, if you can believe that God raised him from the dead, you can be saved. That's clear in Scripture. But there will come a time for every man that repentance is impossible. That is why the Bible makes it clear, abundantly clear, that today is the day of salvation. It is something that can be put off to a point that there's no turning back. So much for there's nothing you can do about it. Don't fall for bumper sticker religion. If your theology can fit on the little back of your car or right here on your t-shirt, I've heard it said, he's the God of a thousand chances. It's not what Hebrews says. I've heard he's never going to give you more than you can handle. Absolutely he will. He's the one handling it in the first place. I was teaching at a revival one time, singing. Preacher was there, and boy, he was fired up. He was one of those that, <gasps> and talked for three seconds, and then, <gasps> he was ready to go, man. And here's what he said near the end. He said, as the good book says, you can't judge a book by its cover. I just went flipping, trying to find it. He thought for sure that was a Bible verse. Listen, no matter what the preacher says, God's word is the only thing that matters. If it ain't in here, it ain't true. Good news. Here it is. When you are a child of God, a believer in Christ, nothing can separate you from that saving love that God has reserved for you. This again is something that scripture makes clear is impossible. It's impossible for the child of God to be separated from the love of God. And the reason I say that is because many have used Hebrews 6 as proof that you can lose your salvation. But as we've discussed, we're not dealing with salvation. We're dealing with something far different. People who have heard, have understood, and have decided it's just not for me. Because if you look further down in Hebrews 6, verses 9 through 12, here's what it says. But beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you. It's a different audience. And things that accompany salvation. Though we are speaking in this way, for God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name. And having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize, here it is, the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you will not be sluggish, imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. First, as I said, you see the writer here is dealing with a different group of people. But beloved, we are convinced of better things about you, clearly referring to a different audience people who have works that accompany salvation. The tone here has completely changed. We see a group of people involved in ministry because of their salvation. And what's the desire of the writer? That each one of them show diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. You can have assurance. And I think many in the church are crippled 
by fear because of their lack of assurance in their salvation. As a matter of fact, at the convention, I was there three days. I had several come up to me who had no idea I was teaching this, didn't even know I was teaching today, asking me these kinds of questions. What do you think about this? And how can I really know? I think one reason is because many in the church have been taught that they were the ones who decided to get saved. And that, of course, can lead to doubt. Once we realize it is God from the beginning who saves us, justifies us, it's the Spirit who seals us and redeems us and ultimately glorifies us, then we can have much more confidence in our position in the kingdom of God. So as we close, I want to look at just a few verses, okay? For anyone struggling with doubt, look at this. We're in John 6, 37 through 40. Let me stop real quick. Chris, thank you for doing all the work that you do. You make it so easy for these folks and the wonderful people watching us on Facebook. Those folks back there work harder than, than anyone. Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. There's assurance. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, it has nothing to do with you, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on the last day. We see there we can put all of our confidence in what God has done instead of what we have done when it comes to salvation. We can have much more confidence in the outcome. Look at Jude, there's just one chapter, so it's verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. Again, when you look to yourself for this, if I look to myself, to keep from stumbling, and then I stumble, doubt. And it just piles up and it piles up. Look to the one who can keep you from stumbling and make you stand in his presence in the end, blameless. Let's look at one more, Romans eleven twenty-nine. 29. This is an unbelievable. For the gifts and the calling of God Look at that word, irrevocable. The calling of God, irrevocable. Listen to what John Gill, theologian says. This is, puts it in a way we can really, really grasp it. The argument here is this, is what John Gill says, that since there are a number of people among the Jews whom God has loved and has chosen and has covenant promised them, secured, laid up gifts for them, determined to call them by his grace. And since all of these things are unchangeable and irreversible, the call and conversion of these persons are sure and certain. In other words, when it is God choosing and calling and sealing, then all of that is irrevocable and unchangeable. I'm going to close. Chris, I didn't give you this one because I, I like the New Living Translation and the way it says this. So you're just going to have to listen. This is going to be a familiar verse to you, but I just want you to hear it. Because I really do believe most all of us at some point have some amount of doubt. And the Bible does say, examine yourselves 
to see that you're in the faith, right? That's something we need to do. But what a horrible existence for the believer to live with doubt. That there's something out there that could separate them from God. This will not be on the screen. If you're watching at home, I encourage you, get your Bible out. You can jot this down. Romans 8, 31 through 39. New Living Translation, listen. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ, Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or persecuted, hungry, destitute or in danger or threatened with death? No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing, nothing, can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow. But let me be clear. As it says many times in that passage, this is referring to people who are in Christ Jesus. So which one are you? I ask this every time I have the honor to speak. There's two groups. One who needs to be sure of a real biblical salvation. They need to be reminded that it is God who chose you, God who sealed you, God who saved you. And you can have confidence in that salvation. Or there's those who have sat under the teaching of God's word. They have tasted and they see that the Lord is good. They have felt the power of the word of God. They have shared in the Holy Spirit. And yet week after week after week, they sit thinking I've got time I'm not going to scare you I'm not here to scare you but the Bible pleads today today is the day of salvation We're not promised tomorrow. I don't know how else to say it. So child of God, have confidence. Confidence. It's God who saved you. Anyone else, have confidence in this. God is merciful and he is loving. 
but he is just. Come to him today. He, he, he wants to save you. He does. Let's pray. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your word. It is truly a two-edged sword. I see so much love in this book. It's just, it's covered. The book is covered with love and mercy and grace and forgiveness, peace. It's all through the pages. But then we come up on something like this and we see the, the righteous judgment that will ultimately bring you glory. God, help us to understand the full counsel of God. And may your spirit speak in a way to each individual that they understand, they comprehend. And Father, I pray that you're drawing them now and that they will respond. And what confidence we have that those you've given to your son will come. And when they do, they will be saved. Thank you for that promise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Would you stand? We're going to do it a little different this morning. Would you stand? The altars are open. You're more than welcome to come here and pray. I'm not going to come down to the front. Um, you know where you stand this morning. If there's a decision that you feel needs to be made, Nikki's standing here. Um, you can come to any one of the people you trust here in this church. Talk to them about it. I know that they would love to share with you the gospel. Let's pray and let's sing.